Okay. Um, so our question here uh, is, is, is the Australian banking system really dysfunctional? How do we fix it? And we just thought we'd interview Peter because it's got some interesting uh, kind of le lessons to learn there. Um, many of the same problems in the UK as in, in Australia. In fact, I would argue almost exactly parallel. Um, and in a true journalistic fashion, um, I'm going to start by asking who should we blame? Um, because ultimately, if there's a problem, there's usually somebody to blame for the problem that needs fixing. And we will come to the fix, don't worry. Um, but can we start with a list of four names? I thought government, banks, investors, and regulators. Let's start with uh, government first. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Hewson, um, uh, government and politicians. Um, in the UK, it took a lot of energy to get the British Business Bank together. It took pretty, pretty determined action by Vince Cable to get it together, along with the Conservative supporter as well. Um, and some people have argued in Australia that the Turnbull government, though very, very kind of positive on the rhetoric around helping small businesses, is falling a bit short on the substance. Um, do you need a British, do you need an Australian business bank, and do you need it now? Well, look, um, it, what you said is true, and all four of those um, <laughs> should be blamed, I think, to some extent. <laughs> but um, even, if the, even if the government had a proposal along these lines, mm -hmm. to get it through the parliament in current circumstances might be very difficult. Why? Because it seems so sensible. It does seem sensible, but we've had a long history of these sort of attempts in the past. We've mm. had um, Commonwealth Development Bank, we've had rural yep. banks, we've had... We've now got a Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund, which does that sort of top-up financing. Yep. Uh, Clean Energy Finance Corporation. Yep. They all have run into a layer of political resistance. What's the resistance? I don't sort of understand in my simplistic and journalistic way. Well, sometimes just because one side proposes it, the other side opposes uh, it. Okay. <laughs> it's a bit of a game being played rather than things being judged on their merits. But I think that's the interesting thing. In the UK, that, for instance, uh, uh, we've also had a, a, a patchwork of individual policies, mm. uh, w which, we've, which was knitted was a together. a strong argument there, pull them all together. Absolutely. And actually, mm. the, the, the British Business Bank, a bit like the, S, the Small Business Administration in the States, is about as apolitical as you could get. Really, nobody bothers questioning it. And in fact, I, I haven't bothered asking the Labour Party in the UK, but I'd suggest they probably say, spend more money on it rather than spend less money. So it's almost apolitical. So I'm slightly struggling. What, what's, what's the... What's well, I, I think there's there. also a level of ignorance at the political level about the problem because, yeah. I mean, they don't really focus on the extent to which the banks will not lend yes. to small to medium-sized enterprises. The impact of uh, regulation of the bank's capital requirements, yep. the fact that they've got massive exposures in fossil fuels and, you know, <laughs> carbon-exposed uh, investments and, and interests, I should say. I mean, there's a very significant constraint. And what it's done is pushed our banks to be little better than business, than building societies with credit cards. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, and that point has not been, I think, effectively recognised at the political level to say this needs to be fixed. And um, so I think there's and a it, big so education task. I mean, what, if I, uh, that awful question we always ask, if you had to put a probability on something like a SBA or a, a B, a ABB, Australian Business Bank, happening in the next five years, what probability would you give it? Uh, quite low, I'd uh, say. Oh dear. Uh, 30%, uh, 40%. Awesome. Look, it, the Conservative wing of the party of the government may say, for example, that we should leave this to the market. And the market's not doing it, so why should we do it? And it's not much of an argument, but it's no, exactly. the sort of argument yeah. they, they could run to, uh, to avoid putting any uh, government uh, you know, financial assistance at risk. Okay, let's spin the bottle around and go to regulators then. So, um, uh, Dermot, um, uh, I, I, before I did that before I get to banks for a very obvious reason that um, one of the things when you talk to banks about why they don't lend money um, in the UK and I'm sure it's the same in Australia, there, there's lots of reasons and basically it all boils down to the regulators because they go, well, let's be honest, uh, lending to small business is really risky, isn't it? And that requires capital requirements that's forced on them. Uh, you've got a question for everybody here. Let's see. Yeah, I just thought um, at the end of a very interesting day, we could have a bit of audience participation. Go on, when, up, we go, when we go around, we generally ask audiences this question. And I think this is probably the most financially literate audience um, that I'm going to come across. So the question is, if you're one of the big four banks and you've got to decide how much, you've, you, the question is, how much capital do you have to put in to $100 of residential mortgage versus $100 of SME loans? So, and I've got an umpire here who knows the answer, so he's not allowed to vote. So the question <laughs> is, for $100 of residential mortgages, 
hands up who thinks the answer is the bank, the big bank, has got to put up $20. Any takers on 20 That's good. Usually there's quite a yep. few around yep. there. Um, what about $10? Or the last answer is uh, $2.50. Okay. And then when it comes to SME loans, is the answer $20? Okay, we've got a few takers over there. That's just quite a bit. Um, $10 or $2.50? <laughs> no one on $2.50. So the answer was $2.50 for resi mortgages, which actually was $1.33 till not so recently. And for SME loans, it varies depending on lots of things, but it's about $10. Westpac, I think, in the financial services inquiry said it was about $8, but it depends on lots of things. So effectively, and, and it, let's understand where this comes from. This isn't, this isn't coming from... No, this, this is This isn't from the bank, the bank, bank risk policy. Oh, I wonder is what number to come up with. This is coming from... Switzerland. Switzerland. <laughs> Basel III. Well, it started with Basel II. Yeah, Basel II originally. 2004, which finally made it into the world in 2008, just in time for bad things to happen. Um, and when you look at the papers that went out at the time from some seriously, you know, intelligent people, the, they, they could see that there could be a problem here with SME credit, but the analysis, and this was based from a European and US perspective, is that SME lending is very much a local business, and there's lots of little institutions who will do that, so the, the banks using the advanced uh, credit scoring uh, risk-based system it doesn't really matter that they'll be penalized because the smaller banks will do it. But obviously in Australia, that's not the case. We've got to... Well, the motivation's been obviously to minimize systemic risk and, yeah, and a exactly. very traditional way of assessing a default risk yeah. on a particular loan. The fact is that when you've leave, left banks to their own devices, they've, as I said before, become building societies with credit unions. Absolutely. So we've got personal debt now, which is above 100% of GDP. Yeah, and that's absolutely So safe. that is a bigger systemic risk, that's the, that's I think, than, yeah. a, than, a, than a small yeah. number of, of, of um, you know, small business loans. Um, okay, Kevin, um, you know, um, I hate to bring up Trump, um, but I am. So um, now, obviously, he's been making noises about lots of reforms around the Dodd-Frank Act, which was obviously deeply unpopular amongst the Republicans in the States. Um, uh, he could, for instance, do something quite, really quite radical and, and arguably a good idea. He could just rip up those Bar three regulations, couldn't he? Um, because let's be honest, if we're looking for supernatural organizations that have been lording it over in an elitist way, forcing banks to stop lending to small, bus to small businesses, that could be his first target. I, I might ring him up and suggest that to him. Um, but I mean, uh, the serious point I'm trying to get across is, is that, do is that the, the Dodd-Frank changes that are coming on down the track, they could encourage lending to small businesses. And that could place places like Australia with a real jeopardy, because actually if the big four in Australia are building societies that issue credit machines, then the, the American economy will power ahead because he'll lift restrictions on the small community banks that do most of the lending to ordinary businesses. So there's a lot in that statement and question. And uh, <laughs> firstly, let me jump to the defence of Basel. Um, I think that when the whole idea of the Basel regime is it's risk-based, that you need to hold more capital against riskier bets. And although you can argue long and hard about just what is the failure rate of small business, et cetera, et cetera, yeah, yeah. there is a lot of evidence and data that they are a lot riskier than a loan secured by residential mortgage in a business as usual environment. And I want to throw that in because if we get a 40% house price fall in Australia, and I'm not predicting it, but that's the sort of falls you saw elsewhere in the world at, at the end of the last decade, then residential mortgages are a whole lot riskier. But um, I think you've got to look at it from a risk-based perspective. And, and risk-based capital makes a lot of sense. Secondly, the fact that you've got Basel means that you, you have a level playing field around the world for internationally active banks. And everyone knows that a bank is a bank. And we have, Paul Clitheroe was talking earlier about how people make simple assumptions when they're investing. If a bank says it's good, I should invest in it mm. because it's a bank. Well, if an international bank also says it's good, then government should feel comfortable about it as well, and regulators should feel comfortable okay. about them coming in. So I, I do want to sort of say that I think that there is a good, there is a good behind Can I, But I challenge that, though, I, that challenge that argument. Um, for the argument used by a lot of the backers of the British Business Bank is, that is true if you're an all-purpose general utility bank. Yeah? Yep. But 
The reality of it is, we all know that in the olden days, there used to be specialist banks that lent to small businesses. They were called merchant banks in the UK, and they're probably versions of yours in, in Australia. And, and, we're, and we're seeing them emerge. British Business Bank is a public version, but in the UK and in America, you have specialist banks that lend to this. They shouldn't be subject to the same conditions. So, so let me come back to the, the question that you asked in, in about hmm. uh, the US and where they're going. And when you look at the regulatory reform that has happened since the financial crisis, it has clearly targeted universal banking. Yep. And the reason it clearly targeted universal banking was because universal banking, if you like, became the norm yep. just before the crisis. Yep. Yep. The banks and gobbled up everybody. Big banks, yep. and they had lots of exposures all around the world in lots of different asset classes. Um, and that led to a wave of reform which was targeted at that sort of bank. The bank that had a lot of trading yep. assets on their books, the bank that had a lot of uh, securitization business going on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we then had a series of reforms which said there's too much risk, and that was quite clear leading up to the crisis, that it was too much risk. So let's take the risk out of the banking system. Now that's a fairly bad concept when you get down to it, if you want to yep. take all the risk out yep. of the banking system. Take all the risk out of the banking system, we no longer have an economy. Yeah. Um, and you no longer have any growth. Now... And there are also, let's be honest, there are no risk-free assets. There are no risk-free assets, and Greek government debt proved that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, um, the new administration in the US, um, in case, A, you missed it, there is a new president in the US, and in case you missed it also, <laughs> he happens to be a property developer. <laughs> So when he comes at regulation, he comes at it from the perspective of a property developer. How many times do I have to fill out the same form to move a stairwell in a building? How many times do I have to fill out a car park application, et cetera, et cetera? So his big thing is red tape. Mm. Um, to the extent that things have been said about financial regulation, he says he doesn't want to make things less safe, but he does want to free up capital for small business. There is talk of him repealing Dodd-Frank. I'm happy to go on record saying he won't repeal all of Dodd-Frank, same as they won't repeal all of Obamacare. But I think that what they will do is, it's almost like you've got to be careful what you wish for. Because some of the things they're proposing, for example, take out all of Dodd-Frank on banking regulation and replace it with a simple 10% leverage ratio. That would roughly double the capital for US banks and probably triple the capital from where they are now for Australian banks. And so there's a lot of detail that people are sort of skimming over with the new administration on terms of where this could go. And you may get a Glass-Steagall type response as well. If you want to be a commercial bank, you're a commercial bank. Absolutely. If you want to be an investment oh, well, he bank. actually argued for that. Yes. He was originally arguing for that. Okay, yeah. let me, the, 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 the bottle's moved around the blame game now to the banks. So um, uh, they, we've already sort of been talking about them. Um, uh, but um, John, um, isn't there a simple answer, break up the banks? Why, can't, why don't the politicians just break the banks up um, and, and start doing stuff like having separate banks for... Uh, we, 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 we've had in the UK you know, dominance by four or five big banks and there has been fitful efforts <coughs> to break them up and to try and get you know, specialist business lenders. Basically, these politicians have just sat around and let these four, business, these four banks be too dominant. I think there's a reasonable probability that they will go that route. Okay. Because you've had this... Um, desire of a lot of banks to be called universal, but yeah. you know, financial conglomerates, doing yeah. everything from insurance, financial planning, yeah. traditional banking, investment banking, yeah. and so on. All of them different cultures, all of them different risks, uh, you know, and all bundled together. And uh, some of those elements of uh, banks, uh, we've seen some financial planning crises, for example, we've yep. seen some foreign exchange crises, we've seen... Yep. Uh, the natural response is to, rather than have a Royal Commission into the banks, is to start saying, we better pl split them up. So I think there's a chance that in the same principle as Glass-Steagall, let's go back yeah, and define same. what is a bank. Yep. I remember in our academic days, I mean, we used to have this conundrum, are banks different because they're regulated or are they regulated because they're different? <laughs> and it's all about how they manage risk. And when you've got a conglomerate, which is all sorts of different risks being bunched together, and, you know, I used the example before about climate risks in the banks, but... The banks didn't only lend money to a coal mine, they actually put equity into the coal yeah. mine through a fund, they bought a coal loader, they invested yeah. in the transport, the, you know, you go through the, Did a trade the, the full exposures up. of mm. some of those deals were just incredible. Do, do, sorry, just before, do you actually think that's realistic though? Do you think they are going to likely break up the big banks? In well, it's very difficult years? to do, but uh, it, it is a political solution. 
Make them independently, think, independent boards, independent management, independent structures. You talked a bit about the more, I'm guessing, more conservative, arguably possibly for more free market, I guess I'm wrong, who would oppose that. Would they oppose that? Not necessarily. They've got to be seen to be doing something. Okay. So can I just add to that, though, that there are already steps underway to do that in the US through traditional power of the market pricing pressures. Absolutely, yeah. So if you're a bank in the US now with more than 700 billion in assets, your leverage ratio is double yep. someone who's smaller than you. Yep. And what they're saying is, if you want to be a big bank with all the risks that comes with it, that's the leverage ratio you yep. have to deal with. If you don't like that, go have a shareholder meeting. Yeah. And if you want to split up... And isn't, isn't it was Zion Bank or something? Well, there's a bank that's about 150 billion that's caught on the cusp and it's trying to push there's it a whole, below. There's a whole, whole group load of them. And that's actually changed the way banks are thinking in the US. Um, there's a, another foreign bank, that there's a foreign bank rule that if you're over a certain threshold, you have to start filing all sorts of regulatory reform, regulatory returns, which is 50 billion. Their, asset, their balance sheet was at 80. They've shrunk it to below 50 so they can avoid it. Okay. So you no longer think traditionally about how can I grow my business. People are actively thinking about how to shrink their banks right now in the US. Uh, the point I was going to make, David, is um, if you look at uh, Australia versus the UK and the, the video you showed earlier was, um, you know, government doesn't like picking winners and yep. there's been a lot of history everywhere and particularly um, way back uh, before 91, 92 in Australia. But... I think the British business bank model is a good one in terms of really solving this problem. The invisible hand that's supposed to solve all these problems in markets, we're, we're kind of over that. We kind of see that the invisible hand mm -hmm. needs a bit of a push sometimes. Yep. Um, and I think the problem in Australia is a lot more acute than in the UK and even Europe because the ecosystem for business finance isn't there. So luckily, when I was starting my career, there was, before Basel II, there was a lot of structured credit and yep. uh, leverage deals and things like that, which actually morphed into the private equity industry, which was completely unregulated, by the way, mm. um, and grew, grew quite nicely. Um, it, but it provided an ecosystem, and we haven't got that here, and that's why I think public policy is really important to recognize the problem. And I kind of wonder, does it need an act of parliament, or is it just about codifying what you already have got. If you look on the government website, the federal government website for business grants and loans, you get 365 results. And there's, it's down to like ACT, I've got an SME growth grant. And when you click on the information, they're gonna give you $5,000 to get expertise on growing your business. It's it's quite crazy. So I think what they did in the UK is they said, well, you know what, that's a crazy way to run business, you know, supporting business. Let's put it all under one umbrella and actually let's co-invest. And that's where I've seen it firsthand in, in private equity funds in the mid-market in Europe. Yeah. So the European Investment Fund, they're probably a strategic investor in a lot of the mid-market private equity funds. Yeah. And I can tell you, a lot of the first closings wouldn't have happened if they didn't get there and then send the signal to New York Oh, actually, this one's a good one. Uh, no, I was just going to say, the, the model they're using for the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund is basically you do your best in terms of funding this project up to whatever level you can, then talk to us about what you need to make it bankable. And they'll right. give the top up in some form. Either they vary the terms of the loans, the length of the loan, or maybe they add to direct cash and so on. That's the mentality that has got some currency so in government. Plus, so it's it? possible that you could take that thinking and apply it to this area rather than all these disparate schemes, which are, which are you know, state and federal mixed. It's um, a mixed bag. But so, uh, but let me look at the last group of people, investors. And, and I think it's picking up in your point, isn't it? which is that in America, there is a recognised investment class which is investing in uh, SMBs in the states. It's been out there, and they actually had a formalised structure called BDCs, Business Development Companies, which is uh, regulated by Federal Act, I think. Um, and that deliberately encouraged listed vehicles that would then lend on to other small, well, more medium sized, to be honest. And they, it's almost a, it's almost a shadow of the structured loan market in the mid markets. Yeah. It's a virtually the same market. Um, now that's had its problems. I'm not going to bother denying it, but it has channeled billions into small S to SMBs. Now, and it's got investors interested, yeah, because it's a yield play, yeah? Frankly, they can do the yield play. Does, 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 does Australia need to do something like that as well? Does it effectively need to do, that's basically a version of, what, of the REIT structure, the pass-through tax vehicle structure, to get investors on, on side so they start putting money down. 
Well, it is, but that's not necessarily a government initiative. No. Um, so the question is why well, the isn't the market... Was. Yeah, but the question is why isn't the market doing that? Yeah, okay, and, fine, yeah. And, is, and how do you bundle up these loans? So there's been lots of talk. Um, in Europe, for the last few years, they've really been focusing on how to get small business lending going. Yeah. They've really seen it as a critical political issue. And one of the things that keeps coming back is securitisation. Absolutely, yeah. But as soon as you say securitisation, everyone goes, financial crisis, this is bad. Yeah. Because it has a bad memory. Securitisation is actually a very good vehicle as long as people know Well, you know think of that scene in the bath in Big Short. Yes. I can't remember the Australian <laughs> actress sitting there explaining securitisation, was Exactly. Wasn't she? Yeah. Yes. And so it's... Um, You've seen that, wasn't it? <laughs> so I think that uh, it's about how you structure those things. There's been lots of problems with REITs in the past. Yeah. Um, and we, sp we heard before about you know, people getting into what they think are liquid investments and they're actually illiquid investments. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And so Constant I problem. think a lot of what we're talking about, though, it comes down to transparency. Yeah. People understanding the risk, transparency, and I think innovation can actually help us with a lot of that. I, uh, just last word, but reading all the negativity about banks and taking them up to camera to give them a good bashing and tell them you know, how they should lend to people and things like that, if we could just turn around the other way and saying, look, we've designed a system which says for banks, we want to keep them safe, residential mortgages and SME credits really dangerous apparently. Although, you know, if you can leverage, if you can have two and a half percent of a mortgage with your bank capital in there versus, you know, what you look at what we're doing, which is one to one, you can, there should be a kind of spectrum here where it's yeah. somewhere in the middle. But if we could actually turn around the debate and stop beating up banks to do things that the system isn't designed to encourage them to do in the first place. Yeah, which is why and I deliberately mentioned regulators before banks. Yeah, so let's turn around and, and let's actually talk honestly about why banks are in SME lending because they actually get more on deposit from SMEs than yes, they lend. Absolutely. Um, and that statistic doesn't come out uh, in Australia, but it's available overseas. They also get mortgage collateral. Yeah. Precisely. The, yeah, this is exactly. the, cheap, the yeah. cheap source of deposits to help them do more residential Perfect. mortgages. Can I ask each one of you, uh, I, I'm aware that you know, look, there's, a, there's a window of opportunity with all political or politics. You know, there's things you are realistically going to achieve. In the next couple of years, what's the one thing you think is achievable that they could do? Have a look at the mid-market that moves the needle and actually do something that's pro-business along the lines of the British Business Bank. Co-investment is the way to do it, I think. Yeah, Not, not, yeah. Mis not use uh, taxpayers' money that's very precious. You m don't misuse yeah. it. Look, I think it's an argument worth running on the basis that, you know, all they're doing right now is to promise a corporate tax cut yeah. for the smaller business end, where most of those businesses are not profitable and won't yeah. get much benefit from it. Yeah. I, I come back to the point that, and you mentioned in your earlier panel, that 95% of small business lenders are going to fail because yep. they're, they're, they're... So there is a, there is a risk-return element here that's not being addressed. And I think that in order to do that, one of the things we can do is it's more about the transparency. And therefore, transparency of data, sharing of data, I think is important in this. And setting up a way for people to actually assess the creditworthiness of small businesses um, would be a more useful investment of, of time and to really understand the asset class because that's what we're talking about. And it's very interesting, the British Business Bank talking to Peter Wilson, he was saying that they've been really big fans and supporters of all efforts to improve data transparency. They haven't done it themselves, but they've encouraged other agencies to do that. Okay, look, I'm slightly aware I've got a red light flashing. Thank you very much. Put your hands together for the light of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin.